So, we're back again like we never left, even though we were never here before, in the VHS graveyard. 1,000 VHS strong, probably another six to 700 pieces of media. DVDs, movies, games, all sorts of stuff. All sorts of stuff from the late 70s to the early 2000s, I would say. It's just sort of a create space where a couple of nerds are gonna regale you with stories of VHS that they found worth your time. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna start it off with a film called Life Force. Everything that we do is gonna be based on a VHS copy. This is an old blockbuster version where the labels have been stripped off and rewritten. Beautiful. And yeah, it is a thing of beauty. Beautiful, beautiful slip case art, which will get you a little something there, a little something, something. And from the back of the box, here we go. Life Force. In the static outer limits of space, a silent terror awaits its next victim. A space exploration to examine Haley's Comet uncovers an alien spacecraft whose occupants carry a deadly secret. Three humanoid forms encased in crystal sarcophagi hover in the comet's tail. These three spacelings need humans to survive. In vampire-like fashion, they murder their prey, seducing their victims, then sucking the life out of them, leaving withered shells of human forms. When the astronauts return to Earth, they unknowingly bring along their alien counterparts and systemically trigger a chain of terror impossible to stop. Life force, in the blink of an eye, the terror begins. Now, Manly Hanley, does that make you want to watch this film? Yeah, I'd say so. Just as an interesting exercise and, uh, you know, the futility of trying to get real representations of IMDb, why don't you read the, uh, <laughs> the yeah. synopsis from IMDb? Right. Ray, a race of space vampires arrives in London and affects the populace, beginning an apocalyptic descent into chaos. Trash. That's what it makes me think of is just trash. I probably wouldn't watch that no, movie. No, me neither. You mean it? Nope, not at all. Not at all. So the film is... Uh, the writers are Colin Wilson, Dan O'Bannon, and Don Jacoby. Mm -hmm. Dan O'Bannon's a guy that you're going to hear from a lot on this podcast because he happens to be involved in either acting or writing or directing in lots of films that I, I seem to like. Um, this film came out in 1985, and I did, in fact, see it at Eastgate Cinemas in mm -hmm. Albemarle, North Carolina. Awesome. With my good friend, Todd A. Britt. Um, I don't imagine you saw this in the theater, no, though, did you? No, I just saw it last night. Right, and you saw the beautiful uh, yes. VHS reel oh, yeah. that I was able to transfer to you. It was beautiful. It was uh, actually nice. I actually didn't mind. I like the quality. It was like you were watching a VHS tape on a VHS player yes. without the VHS player. Right? Yes, exactly. Well, I've seen it plenty of times mm -hmm. uh, on, on my VHS copy. I have multiple copies of it. Um, but this time for this review, I actually watched the HD version of it oh, on yeah. uh, on Voodoo, that's kind of my jam now. If I really care about a film and being able to see it in its highest quality, yeah. I will always you know, purchase it at the right time, mm -hmm. as economically as possible, on uh, Voodoo.com. And you know, you never can scratch those. Nope. You can't break those in a yep. old VCR. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a good way to go. As far as the uh, HD version of this, the effects hold up. And I think one of the things that sets this film apart, apart from a relatively original take on the vampire mythos, mm. is that... The practical effects are genius level. Yes. At the mm -hmm. time, there's, they actually hold up today, and that's I saying so, yeah. something mm -hmm. in the age of shows like Tales from the Crypt, yeah. where they have dedicated advanced robotic mm -hmm. creatures. Yeah. Um, you know, they can make dinosaurs. Photo and, real CG, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff. yeah, yeah. yeah th this film had a very little CG, but like used perfectly in concert mm -hmm. with practical makeups. And yeah. to me, that made it uh, quite special. You know, like I, I felt like it was. Uh, it's it's an outlier. It's an outlier in that it's such a goofy con concept and looks so low budget, but yet conversely, it has some of the most high tech puppetry yeah. that you're ever going to see. And like when I when I saw the VHS version, because I saw a VHS rip of it, honestly, the quality of it, even though it was low, it added a lot to it. And I mean, like you said, it wasn't probably maybe the effects weren't lower quality based on that, but I will say that the lower quality rip of this made it added a lot more vibe to the matte paintings, the the uh, miniatures, the puppets, and like you said, even the early, I don't even know if it would be CG, maybe they even did, because I know early days they wouldn't In actually camera. do CG, and they'd actually do like, um, they'd hand draw lightning. And you stuff might like be that. right about I that. I don't know, but I know, I mean, and I think there's even a stop motion moment at the very end. I could be wrong, I couldn't quite figure out what, I couldn't look at the frame right to see, but it looked a little janky, it could have been a puppet, but at the very end there's a vampire 
that got revealed and it looked like it was stop motion. But either way, I mean, it's great looks, yeah. I love stop motion and there's definitely stop motion to come on this podcast. Um, many of my favorite films involve it. It's actually a technology I even dabble with myself oh, yeah. just for fun. Um, in, in concert with your CG that you can accomplish on this laptop now, mm. you can get some really good results, you know, like uh, yeah. with, with, with CG and homemade puppetry. Oh, yeah. Of course, at the time, you know, you, you, they didn't have these parts. Yeah. They had to be machined for this, mm -hmm. which makes it all the more impressive. That's where all their budget went. I don't know what the yes. budget was, yeah. but it certainly wasn't spent on the sets, mm. uh, which were very, very bare and stark. Well, but, the first, I think the first set was really nice on the spaceship. I thought that was actually, and, well, the, and, the, and the, when they went to the alien ship of on Halley's Comet, I thought that was really Yeah, cool. well, let's, let's get into the story a little yeah, bit yeah, and how it's true. set up. The setup is, it starts off with a, a narration and a little bit of on-screen, uh, you know, text that tells you that a joint uh, UK-US space mission um, is heading out to study Halley's Comet. Mm -hmm. When they get there, they find a craft that is 150 miles long. Huge. And yeah. now, when they when they start getting into specifics, they sort of paint themselves into some, into some corners, yeah. which, yeah. you know, they're gaffes. Like, later on, they'll contradict themselves. For example, they said they were going into the head of the vessel, which was two miles tall. It was like sort of a spermatoa or something like a tadpole with a giant head and a long, long yes. tail yeah, yeah, when yeah. they showed it on the graphic. Uh, and it was rudimentary graphics at, yeah, at best, was, yeah. the best a computer could do, I guess. <laughs> Nobody will ever need more than two megabytes nope, of memory. Definitely not. But um, yeah, so they go into it and they did this really cool set design where it was a lot of bulbous pods, kind of mm. nebulous in the distance and the, the astronauts floating perfectly straight, hanging uh, like they were hung by yeah, an yeah, eye right, yeah, yeah. floating perfectly they straight. Were. And they, occasionally they, you'd have, have the little sound yeah. effect to imply they had jets like, <laughs> but you would never see any jets. You didn't even you catch know? that, yeah. Yeah, so they're going into the head of the vessel, and they see all these pods, and then they start seeing um, these, uh, and, and I think if, you know, in my mind's eye, I got to say, two miles is way bigger yes. than what you, two miles tall is way dang it's, bigger than what, you, what yeah, you would have yeah. what you saw on screen. Yeah. It was more like 200 feet, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, but they get in there, and there's these floating uh, bat-like humanoid creatures, but like mm -hmm. if you can imagine just a, a vampire bat with arms and legs and big old yeah. wings, mm -hmm. and they're all mummified and floating. So, the uh, the Colonel, what was his name? Oh, I, see, I can't uh, remember now. Colonel Carlson, yeah, played Carlson. by Steve yeah. Rollsback. Yeah. Colonel Carlson, uh, he's he's a bit of a uh, kind of not exactly a hothead, but real real like prone to action before thinking. It seems like mm. he's like, let's go over there and grab those guys, yeah, you know. And yeah. he goes over there and he grabs one. He goes up to the first creature and grabs it. Breaks his finger off. Mm. Now, just the way my mind works, I'm a completist. I can't stand to get my toys broken. <laughs> I hate when my action figures get the fingers snapped off. Yeah. So I would have never snapped the finger off. I'd have been super ginger with it, you know, <laughs> and very careful. But he snaps the finger right off and didn't even seem to bother him because he's like, oh, there's thousands of other of these specimens. Mm. But then he goes, oh, you know, it's uh, completely desiccated or whatever. Been opened to space, etc. So it's a complete mummy type form mm -hmm. with no moisture. Then he goes, let's bag it up. Now, right. and, and me, and this is a little quirk. But me, had I been uh, Colonel Carson, I'd been like, okay, we already effed this one up. Let's go over and get, get a, a fresh, fresh one, one. Yeah. that has all of his fingers. <laughs> and then if you watch later in the movie when this creature, of course, yeah, I never of this. course he's going to come back to life. Mm. He has all his fingers. Yep. Mm. And I'm like, dudes, come on. That was easily avoidable. Yeah. Who's yeah. your continuity director, yep. right? Mm -hmm. But uh, basically, then they, then they, uh, there's a there's a signal. Some there's some movement with the ship, yeah. mm -hmm. and then there's a signal um, light. They they sort of yeah. build some tension there because you think something's going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically, they just part of the outer ship opens up. The people yep. outside start freaking out. Hey, it's moving, and uh, you know he sort of shouts in the back and forth. Let me know if anything else changes. And then there's a signal coming from a, a command center. Right. And they float perfectly vertically inside <laughs> into that. Yeah. And what do they find? Three people. In Humanoids. Little, human, yeah, humanoid people. And the men seem very enthralled by the woman. Extremely enthralled. I wonder why that could be. I don't know. Maybe well, they just haven't had enough action in space. I, if I'm being real and honest, the, the fact that there's this gorgeous Matilda May, she was quite young at the time. I mean, she was probably 19 or 18 when this was shot. Uh, and she is she has no issues with on-screen nudity, let's just say that. None of them uh, do. The, the, the sheer volume of full frontal, I mean, like if... George, or if Roger Corman is to be believed, I mean, this film should have had three sequels, but um, but it didn't, <laughs> thankfully. But uh, yeah, I was I remember walking away from this film thinking this this is my new favorite movie, but uh, maybe not for the content other yeah. than the her, all of the Space Girl scene and her character is called Space Girl, That's which it, yeah. which I always dug that and I thought man, that'd be a great name for a band. Yeah. Speaking of bands, 
let's talk about how we uh, our two spheres of influence sort of bumped and created the VHS graveyard real quick. Okay. Um, one day I'm down at our business and this uh, this tall, lanky, redheaded cat walks in and he's like, "Hey, you need to find out about recording with this this guy that you record with up there." And I said, like, "Sure, I'll tell you everything." And, you know, like 30 minutes later, we're up here going through my YouTube channel, yeah. and I'm looking at his YouTube channel, yeah. and I'm like, this is weird. This is like a slightly more active uh, version of my YouTube channel. I mean, in that, just so quirky and content just ranging, like somebody just like yeah. shot a shotgun of paintball pellets at a wall at close proximity, and then just everywhere it splatters, you have a video or six. Yes, yes. You know, <laughs> or six, yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? And then, you, and then you have some of these updates, and then you have these, these self-made... Um, you know, of course, both of us being musicians and composers yeah. and super active in that, we immediately were just, I remember at the time, it was so ironic because I was like, yeah, well, I got this band together right now and we don't have a keyboard player. Can you play a keyboard or at least a little bit? He's like, oh, sure, I can play a little. What he really meant was he's really good. I can play only a little. Well, you said the he's same thing nice. about your drums and the first time, the first song we recorded in the studio and the drums, you actually nailed it the first time, <laughs> insisted on doing a second take. I was like, man, I can't afford a second take. You <laughs> nailed it the first time. But... I digress. So we ended up, you know, collaborating yeah. on music mm -hmm. and other things, and, yeah. and this just became the natural extension because we both have like a kind of an obsession with movies. And mm, yeah, I watched absolutely. some of your reviews on your mm -hmm. Man Handling channel, yep. and uh, they were uh, they were good. And I watched a documentary you did on like an album that you made yep. in two years, and it's like yep. a, it's total cinema verite, I guess you'd say. But, uh, but I really liked, and then I started watching your Saturday jam sessions where you oh, wow. going back that. to when you could barely play guitar, which was. <laughs> I just thought, God bless him for putting this out here, because like only a guy like me that went through, through the straight, the same same struggles, although you're way more accomplished than me, I um, I appreciated that, and I appreciated like the self belief of putting something of yourself out there, knowing that it's not good, but it's gonna be good, yeah. and there's gonna come a time where you're gonna be glad yeah. that you had this. So that, that's why I'm such a freak about recording all of our making ofs and whatnot. Mm, yeah. But I digress. We got here. Here's where we got, and yeah. um, you know, you were a filmmaker almost like completely on your own it seemed like mm -hmm. i was yeah. a filmmaker in the context of working with some other people but eventually you know i made my own things i've made my own music videos you've made your own, own music yeah. videos yeah. um i i make digital art you make digital art mm -hmm. you know so confluence of uh of influences sort of at a crossroads brought yeah. us together to make this so yeah I don't know why we're doing this right in the middle of a, a review. Right. Uh, probably because this is our second take on episode yes, one, but uh, yeah. <laughs> because one of us forgot to hit the record I did, button. I did, I did, I did. <laughs> classic, I did, classic yeah. manly handling. Yep. <laughs> yes. So anyway, long story short, you know, I'll be referring to myself as Brento. My name is Brent Bowers. Um, I'm just a regular guy and uh, husband, father, granddad. And then the contrast here is that you are quite the youngster, uh, as it were. And you're like a single dude with uh, your guitars, yes. I guess, or your children. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Uh, yeah, you can call me Manly Hanley. My technical name is Harrison. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I've been, I've, my musical stuff, yeah, I've been, me, me and Brenda working on music stuff. But yeah, like you said, I've been doing that for a while on my own. Uh, the quality is varying, <laughs> as is my video quality on YouTube is varying. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of why we kind of started working together. It's very similar interests. Yeah. Very much a man in the arena concept as far as the varying quality, because I feel like hard work beats talent that doesn't work hard. But, mm. you know, also that old saying, like a jack of all trades is a master of none. The full saying is actually, but still better than a master of one. Mm. Well, that's how nice of you. You see what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, if, yeah. You, if you put a lot out there, you have a lot of... You've added to the collective, the artistic yeah, collective. Yeah. I remember really hammering that that uh, John Carpenter film. Not, is it John Carpenter? Dark Star? Mm, maybe. Yeah. Um, it could be. I hated that film. It was a student project, and it's kind of a space. Sci it presents itself as a sci-fi. John Carpenter, yeah. Um, but it's more of a comedy, and it started as a student film. A lot of people really love it, but um, but I hated it. And uh, at the time, I was like, this film has no value, and uh, it should have never been made. And like a good buddy of mine, Robert Fillion, great filmmaker too, by the way, pointed out it should have been made because it exists. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. I thought about that, yeah. and I pondered on that, and I was like, darn, like that's, that's true. Mm -hmm. That is yeah. true. So Life Force made a lot of young boys happy, <laughs> and uh, I'm sure it was an abysmal failure at the box it was. office. It came but, out the same time as Cocoon did. Well, and I think that might be quite, part of the reason why. Quite a difference in the budget between those two yes, films, I would that, say. Yes. Uh, and and e even being a genre guy, it's not as good of a film as Cocoon. I, mm -hmm. I'll admit that. But I don't 
when have I rewatched Cocoon? I think I saw really? that in the cinema. I never rewatched wow. it. So yeah. This film I've rewatched <laughs> again times. a few obvious reasons, but I have rewatched it at least three times since seeing it in the theater back in the day and back in 1985 in Albemarle, thinking I hope they make more films like this. Mm-hmm. But they never did, and that's yeah. kind of like another thing that. Uh, so if you say if you conjure so behind us today on the TV here, we're watching um, my uh, VHS copy of. Jack Pounce is Dracula. We may get into this one a little bit later. This one's pretty easy to find online, um, at least to download. But um, one of my favorite uh, Draculas, probably the most menacing Dracula. I know that Christopher Lee is a lot, a lot of people's favorites, and I do like him as Dracula. But what Jack Pounce just b- brought a real sinister element mm. to it. Um, you know, when he has that real evil grin, it just works perfect with the thing. I so, yeah. Um, yeah, so we're kind of watching my ratty VHS copy of that right here. And look at that shot right there, Harrison. Very yeah. classic, uh, very classic imagery for for uh, the word vampire. And this is anything but yeah, classic anything imagery but for vampire. Yep. Everything about it. So it's based on a based on a book called Space Vampires. Yes, yeah, just Space Vampires. Yeah, I, I I would love to find that book. I yeah. don't know if it's available anywhere, but uh, I I did look on Audible and it wasn't there. Of course, you know what happens is if it's a film it'll be like a life force adaptation oh yeah and I don't, i'm yeah. not interested in that yeah. uh, space vampires space vampires book let's see if it's out there the space vampires uh yeah it oh, actually okay. is wow you can buy that actual book on amazon for about 1378 not bad you check that out it's not available in any of in any other. It's format, available like on audio. Kindle, which okay, is okay. Kindle hardback, hardcover, and paperback. Okay. Um, and there's used. Okay, that was a used version actually, but the Kindle, the Kindle version, I might have to check out. Yeah. I'm I'm very curious about it. Yeah, because I wonder if it's anything similar to the vibe of it at all. You know. I mean, well, very, I feel very... like it's an adaptation because, like, really? right, the first the, the, the excerpt says, when Captain Carlson entered the vast derelict spaceship. He was shaken by the discovery of its immobilized humanoid passengers. See, now this is taking even a different tag mm. than the IMDb yeah. or yeah. the box. Later, after three of the strange aliens had been transported to Earth, his foreboding was more than justified. Uh, I mean, he basically went AWOL, yeah, and the really, ship yeah. was, was gutted. They basically recovered the three humanoids and only bodies. I can't remember how he actually showed back up. but uh, I think he escaped out of some kind of oh, pod. Oh, the escape, I think. The yeah, escape yeah, yeah. pod, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure, yeah. Yeah, so and that and that particular scenario right there is played out in how many sci-fi movies? Yeah, you know where only one member of the one crew survived. survives, yeah, yeah. and he's you got the alien. And you won't believe me if I told you. <laughs> right, 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 right. But a book by Colin Wilson. He also was involved in this the screenplay. So I don't know. The only thing about I was maybe the book takes more time, but I feel like that like even though I like a lot of aspects of it, I, and I mentioned that like I don't think I mentioned this yet, but like. It has a lot of aspects of Alien, at least the beginning. It's almost like three different films, almost for me. It's like Aliens at the be- Alien at the beginning, and then like Invasion of the Body Snatchers when the infection starts, and then when the infections kind of like spread. It's like a zombie movie. It feels like a lot of different things. So I wonder if the book is anything similar to that. And I would hope it also takes more time with things because I felt like it kind of jumped the ship at a certain point in certain areas at least what do you think was that osha that ins- expanded the inspections or <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> no i actually you, you bring a good point because i was going to say one of my favorite parts of the film and like you said it was a film into itself was everything that took place in space was yeah. like a straight sci-fi i love that part. and i found myself really digging that part Same. even yeah. though even though they didn't have the budget yeah, you know, like keep a, going. A hundred and fifty yeah. mile long ship with a two hundred mile, a two mile high. Yeah, that's not what the visual said. Yeah, but the visual said trying to make a cool sci-fi movie. Yeah, and I thought like it did uh, good. The vertical flight of the astronauts. I don't know. That still mm-hmm. sticks with me. <laughs> You know the Minerva engine, which they explained away. The guy's not floating in their ship. And that's oh, it's the, the, yeah. it's the it's the new Minerva, Minerva engine, which uses constant acceleration to create artificial gravity. <laughs> Problem solved. Yeah. Don't have to have our astronauts yeah. floating. Yeah. How much money did we just yeah. save? Cha ching. Yeah, and that's the thing about a lot of movies that I, maybe not even any, really any movie that can kind of get in a problem is you know people want to be. Ex- some people say, oh, I want to understand what it means, but really you kind of want to. There's a little bit of mystery because I mean I wrote down a list of things that like right in the middle of the movie. It started explaining way too many things. So, for example, again, spoilers, don't, don't, there's a brain connection where he can see what the other lady sees, uh, the colonel guy. Um, she can switch bodies, apparently. Um, she now doesn't want to kill everybody. She just wants to suck a little bit of their life force. Um, 
and somehow there are two minds in the same body so they can coexist so there's two consciousnesses in the same body they're vampires which wasn't explained until like the hour mark really and um and the fact that like but then there was a statement at the very last two minutes where she says oh by the way you're you're one of us too and i'm like he was a van and it's like and there's way t- so that's the thing that a lot of these movies i feel like can they can get away with themselves by trying to explain too much there's there's a, a beauty in mystery you know and that's the thing that i feel like some movies kind of lose track of that's a great point did i drop the spoiler warning because we just i think we did not out of this i think but, we did uh yeah i said it right before spoiler, i started talking spoiler warning yeah um you know uh this was called by the chicago tribune as a this was called a new slant on horror and i have to say it was exactly that if yeah. you, everything you said was accurate um i think dan o'bannon is sort of known as a screenwriter to go a little far in the explaining things direction but have really I just recently watched that film there the first one on your list there it's dead and buried you can hold up yeah. to the camera there man that is a uh, that's an incredible film and it has a completely original premise it's hard to yeah. find those but once again that's a Dan O'Bannon script I believe I think he's actually in that as well mm. uh, as one of yeah, the, the, one of the townspeople mm-hmm. um, but at the end of it it does get a little heavy on the yeah. explanation and yeah. I was like gosh it, although that one's so crazy no explanation could really explain it and oh, there yeah. are fairly obvious plot holes but it has to do with just a magical immortality uh, mm. but you have to die violently to get the immortality so interesting okay. we, we got to yeah. get into that yeah. one first, and mm. that's that that's yeah. that one is one of a kind uh, and again just like life force it's an outlier in fact most of these films here are outliers mm. in that they are in a genre that you think you know what it is but you don't really like Dead Alive, for example. It's a zombie film, but it's not a zombie film. Oh, it's, yeah. It's crazy. That's, yeah, like Life Force. It's technically yeah. a vampire film, but it's not. Yes. Yeah, not yes. anyway. Absolutely. Um, gosh, I mean, I, I, I got to say that this one is one that I think deserved any attention that we can give to it. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you're a fan of vampire films or sci fi films, there's no way you watch this movie and not go, man, I'm glad I checked that out. Yeah. And I will say, I'm not a fan of vampire films, generally speaking. Um, uh, the only one that I can really care for is uh, the I uh, gosh I, I'm forgetting the name of it. Gary Oldman's in it. Got oh, it. Dracula. Yeah, just yeah that that Bram one. Bram Stoker's yeah. Dracula. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. I, that's my I love that movie, but like generally speaking, like just vampires don't interest me. And but for me, the the reason why I like this is because there was like you said, there's a lot of sci-fi elements in it, and that really that hooked me in the in the beginning. And that's a really good hook at the beginning. And it doesn't really. I mentioned this. I was thought about this, and I was like, because I, I didn't. I was imagining that maybe something to add a little bit to the mystique was maybe not even use the word vampire, but use the word succubi, which is like a, which is like a, I don't remember what the exact lore is, but basically it's just this feminine, like, I don't even know if it's a spirit or whatever, but like in old uh, mythology and stuff where it's like a feminine thing that would seduce men, which is really all she's doing, realistically speaking. And I feel like that would have added a little bit more to the mystique, but I mean, maybe not growing up in the 80s, I don't know if vampires were a big deal. Uh, maybe. And that was like a huge popular thing. But It was extremely popular. See, so yeah. It was so, extremely popular. So that, yeah. maybe that's why they so showed So you were only around for the glittery, wussified vampires like in, <laughs> what's that horrible show that they have so many sequels to? Uh, Edward and Bella. Oh, uh, Twilight? Lord Jesus, <laughs> save us. <laughs> I've watched um, a few of those. <laughs> yeah, oh, I had to. They're not, I had, they're not I had, the, they're not the had, worst thing I've ever experienced. I had, no, they're not the worst thing I've ever experienced, <laughs> but they're down there. But my daughter was the right age, and those films were marketed to her, so I yeah, took her to see yeah, those. And yeah. freaking glittering vampires, man! I just feel like it just kind of took the balls away from the whole vampirism mythos. But um, I tend to like the ones that are more like vampires are. And there's a bunch of books I can recommend. We should do a vampire special, actually. Hmm. Um, there's a bunch of books that I think get it really, really right because, like, um, I think the the uh, character arc for anybody that chooses to become a vampire is that it's not the life that you think it is. Mm, Immortality yeah. comes with a price. You yeah. don't get to just be yourself forever mm-hmm. and do what you want. You're basically a slave to these desires. Yeah. And in a lot yeah. of cases, that character is sort of portrayed as um, as a kind of a charming, smart yeah. guy who yeah. gets intelligent over time mm-hmm. from life experience. Right? Like if you had you or me or what we are, but if we had two thousand years of life oh, experience, we'd be yeah. a whole lot smarter. Yes. You know, yeah. obviously. But in this case, like all that your per- human persona is ripped away, and you're basically mm-hmm. just a beast yeah. feeding a hunger, you mm-hmm. know, yeah. um, like a hungry grizzly bear or something, mm-hmm. you know, or vampire bat, if you will. Hey, let's talk about the uh, Doctor Armstrong character, played by a young, full ha- head of hair having Patrick Stewart, pre Jean Luc Picard. Mm. Like that's a trip to me to watch now. I don't, was, know, yeah. I don't know if you ever got into Star Trek. Not really, but I, I watched every that. single yeah. episode. Really? Mm. Uh, yeah, except for all the the new Picards, they're not really to my liking. I won't get into why because I don't want to slam anything Star Trek. I'm glad they're trying to make Star Trek now, whatever they're making. 
Um, I don't love the new shows, mm. but uh, but man, uh, the Next Generation. I loved. I've seen it. I was living in Japan. People, mm -hmm. this Canadian that I work with, people would ship him boxes where they would just record the show with the commercials. And when you're starved for English speaking yeah, you, content, man, that that's a great day going yeah, there imagine. and bomb a couple people and uh, watch I don't know six episodes with all the commercials <laughs> during the day. So yeah. uh, I have you know Star Trek is near and dear to me, right. but uh, you know he's a great actor in, in, in anything really, even when he has terrible material like with the new good, show, yeah. um, he's still a certain level he doesn't fall below. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, he's he's in this, and actually the exploding blood hologram or whatever that was freaky yeah i like that i still don't know how they did that that's I, like, yeah the visual effects well we'll call them visual for the makeup the special makeup effects is what they really, used to call yeah. them those those hold up so so well yes. in this film and um i mean I, I guess i would just have to say like uh, on a scale of uh you know one to five tombstones what would you give this in the vhs graveyard well considering this is the first one and i don't know the threshold of good and bad yet um i I'd give it three right now. I'm I'm content. I'm I'm I'd like it. I think There's that's some fair. reservations. You know, I think that's but I fair. Like um, we're gonna. I, I would probably give it like a three three point five. So okay. we'll, we'll just oh, we can average, do decimal points. We'll just average <laughs> that out to three point two five tombstones in the VHS yes. okay. graveyard. Okay. And we'll recommend that you guys yeah. check out yeah. whatever version. The great thing about Life Force is that it is one of these. Um, rarish VHS's but you can for sure find it on voodoo.com yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, there's plenty of places you can watch it online so so do yourself a favor and check that out and then as far as what's next uh, on, on VHS Graveyard what are, what are you feeling there um, I, I think I want to go more horror I want to well, go more we can certainly yeah. do that because I mean there's aspects of horror in this but even more maybe we can certainly do that and is there any particular genre that thrills you to, to, to move into mm. did you ever watch any of the full moon films by the way no no. Like, so you never watched anything like Dr. Mordred with the no. with the super sweet video zones at the end of them, like a video magazine. Interesting, uh, no. They produced so many, they were always trying to hype the next thing. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Rated R or restricted. That would be a good one to go to. <coughs> we will, <coughs> pardon me, coughing up a little space vampire there. We will put our heads together, proverbially speaking, and, and figure out what's next. But uh, there's so many. Well, I mean, I have a ton right here that, of course, uh, the great the great thing that gets me jazzed up about doing a new episode of the VHS Graveyard is I can walk over to this wall, which, you know, I'll share an image of. Uh, and I can just literally stand there and just, like, stare yeah. into oblivion. And, I'm, <laughs> and in my eyesight, is like, probably 500 tapes. And I'll just, like, go, oh, that, that catches my eye. Like the other day, Mouth of Madness. Hey. Yeah. That's, that is a, a, hey, that's the one that we could try. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the Mouth yeah. of Madness starring Sam, Sam Neill. Yeah. Yep. That is a truly scary movie. Are you familiar with Event Horizon, by the way? I am. I've that seen a, scenes, and I'm scared. That is a <laughs> that honestly, that might be the scariest sci-fi horror really? okay. that I have ever seen, and that's yeah. one that still scares me on rewatch. Which is uh, yeah, it's, there's a lot of like real fast cut imagery in that mm. with hell scenes that are I think are probably done with miniatures, but it looks yeah. so real. Interesting, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mi I would like I would love to get into miniatures and. Maybe do some some skits and whatnot, but there'll be elements to this show that um, you know expand it from just two nerds talking. I hope at some point, and um, yeah, we're gonna get a few of these in the bag, and then you'll we'll be launching mm -hmm. for certainly you know for for certain it will be out by um, by Halloween of 2022. Oh yeah, and in full force on iTunes and Spotify. I hope. Yeah. Well, cool. Uh, thanks for joining me in this discussion of Life Force, and um, yeah, any closing remarks? Um, overall, I mean, like like you said, anything you can think about, any way you can find to stream this or watch this, I actually prefer the VHS. I mean, even though I haven't watched the full one, I actually kind of like the feeling that the VHS gave. How did you How did you feel about the uh, the VHS transfer of? Uh, you actually watched the physical VHS of uh, Mouth of Madness. Technically, yeah. I can't remember how good that one looks. Was it? It looked nice. Pretty, pretty good. Pretty okay. good. Yeah, it looked pretty yeah, good. It's, yeah, it's and, and why why VHS? I mean, like I, a lot of people like don't really get that, but I'm just like. There's, I don't know, like... Um, it depends you, on you what you're that, watching, too. When you put that in yeah. your hand and you feel that little bit of shake, it's a real thing. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I was, I was alive for just the tail end of VHS being a thing, so I still have fond memories of it, but not as much as you do, I would say that. Yeah, there's, a tactile, as as there's a tactile element that yeah. excites me and, and I, I find to be very... Um, just intriguing, and it, like I said, staring at the physical media, it's all about the slipcase. Like I'm, I've got probably a hundred tapes that are that don't have slipcases, and I think I'm going to actually rip those and get rid of them just to make more space yeah. for the for the the rare and the intriguing and the advanced uh, 
well, not advanced, but like the rarer yeah. tapes. You ever seen Vamp, that vampire film Vamp, by the way? Mm -mm. Oh man, so no. many, so many great ones. But you say you don't like the vampire. We can do the vampire outliers though. That okay. are like more horrific like, yeah. vampires. Uh, yeah, I, I don't like the wussy vampires myself. <laughs> but it's ironic because like a lot of people view the. Um, we should definitely do a Gary Oldman special. I love that oh, guy. Oh yes, I uh, agree. But Bram Stoker's Dracula, man, oh. he got a lot of hate, which is I'm, I don't understand at Keanu all. Keanu Reeves got a lot of hate for that. Keanu one too. Reeves, yeah. listen, I think the man's a fine actor, and, and Winona as well got a lot of hate in that. And I, I think all three of those people are like really. Yeah. Okay, so Keanu Reeves is fair to say is somewhat typecast now. Yeah. But it's yeah. it's it's, I'm not going to curse on this, but it's bad a it's bad a stuff like you know shooter killer kind of a thing yeah. or martial arts and yeah. neither one of those put me off yeah. so even yeah. if he is typecast i think he's a fine actor went on a writer come on have you have you seen stranger things i mean she's yeah. amazing yeah. she's 